Okay, thank you and welcome to this conference. My name is Wolfgang Roch. I'm from Dippetron Society. The society was founded in 2003 and it's organizing physicians and patients. It's an international <laughs> group and we consider ourselves as a joint interest and action group. <coughs> joint is important and international is important. International because the difference doesn't care about borders, so why should we? And joint is because we don't see any value in separating physicians, physicians and patients. So it, 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 we, we try to get them together. I should mention probably at this point that we are a non-profit organization and everyone working in this organization, unfortunately including myself, is unpaid volunteers. So we are located in Germany, that's for historical reasons, you have to be located somewhere. And it has some other good reasons, like, like this one, that's where we are located. Other people are, other people are going on vacation there, so hey, you might come as well and see us. Okay, that's something I should mention as well, that's, there's nothing to disclose. Uh, this society actually funded, funds itself out of donations. So we are chronically short of money, unfortunately. <coughs> now, to my personal history, I'm a patient. So I, I brought Dipitrons to the conference, so I thought that might come in handy at some point. Uh, I developed my first nodule 25 years, uh, 28 years ago. It was radiated at that time, and uh, you can see it here, no recurrence, no nodule, nothing. So I, I consider that a success. The second nodule uh, then came about eight years later, on, on the other hand, and uh, because I wasn't sure whether it was the radiation which had helped me, I thought, oh, <laughs> I give it a try and do nothing. So un unfortunately, I wasn't very educated at that time. So I had to have fasciectomy 10 years ago, because by that time my finger was like that. And, but again, after 10 years, no recurrence. So the uh, fasciectomy is, is also considered very successful. Yet, there, there's a, a downside of it. After and immediately after the <coughs> surgery, I had a rapid extension in, in other areas of both hands, I, I need to say. So within six new nodules, nodules within four weeks, sprang up and started growing quite actively. And frankly, uh, although the surgery itself was certainly very successful, as a patient, I felt horrible. So <laughs> I, 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 thought, I initially thought it was a disaster today, I, I see it a little bit differently, but it's, it's an example that the perception of the surgeon and of the patient can differ quite a lot. Yeah. And uh, I'm also suffering of, of lederhose, but suffering is maybe an exaggeration, so I have two small nodules and, and they don't really bother me. Now, further to, the, uh, to my personal history, this is, I, I developed a nodule on the um, a pip of my small finger and as a preventive means, and that's interesting, I wore a night splint, uh, that one on the top there, and uh, I loved it because it took less than a second to put it on and put it off. It was very convenient to wear, so that was perfect, but it had a side effect. Let me see how that does it work here. <coughs> it had a side effect and shown here. I developed at the edge of this thing, I developed a considerable fibrosis. And within three or four months, it, 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 came, it became very obvious and very thick. And then I stopped wearing this uh, thing, but it was really at this little edge. And where other people might just develop a little bit of callus or whatever, I developed fibrosis and consequently also a considerable cord here. So I, I found that uh, remarkable. And uh, it, it reminded me of the theory that uh, Dipitron is a exaggerated wound healing. Well, I didn't have a wound, but maybe something nagging a little bit. And yeah, let's forget about this one. That's 
that's a test of uh, whether B venom uh, is affecting digitrans or I might be able to heal it and then this, this poor guy is just about to die for the sake of science. <laughs> But let's have a look here. That's my, my other hand, and on the left side you see the surgery. I, I was cut on the right side, you see uh, that there's nearly no scarring. So I'm not suffering of extensive scarring. So, in, rather, I think I, I'm healing, my hand is healing very well. But I still developed, on, just because of the age of this little night splint, I developed impotence. I, I found that remarkable. Okay, now uh, I, I'm trying to get away now from my personal history, but uh, I thought you might as well know where I'm coming from. And if you have some questions, Charlie uh, showed us many more. So these are just some things which, which come up and which I don't like that much. There is, one is, uh, there's a frequent statement in publications, men get trans X times as frequently as women. If you look at the data, it looks like this. and. Uh, that actually men get it earlier. Now, if you want to get a specific relation, it just depends on what age you're looking at. If you want to get a 10 to 1, you might want to look at 40, and some uh, other publications report 1 to 1 with 80 or above. So the real statement is men get it earlier. Nobody knows why. There have been some attempts to explain it, but I haven't seen anything convincing yet. And the other question which I find interesting is, why is there an age dependence at all? Why is that not a flat curve? Do we accumulate damage in, in the course of our life, or do we lose something like the fat in, in our hand, so it, it's getting more uh, dangerous to do something? Is uh, personal occupation, including maybe hobbies or whatever, also an a factor? I don't know, but it's something which I find very interesting. Uh, the other statement also, still frequent unfortunately, is it's a disease of people with Nordic descent, a Viking disease maybe even. And if, if you look at the data again, then you see it's in Japan, in Spain, and in Norway, it's, it's all over. And uh, even Bosnia, and then we'll hear more about that. So it's rather a global disease. So not equally distributed or equally frequent in every country, but it, it's global and uh, certainly in areas where the Vikings never came to. And it's, so it's not a normal disease. The genetics may give us an answer at some point of time, and I hope we'll hear more on this conference. <coughs> now, getting to the typical society and <laughs> what we are doing, uh, first, of course, is patient support. So we are supporting organizing local patient groups. We have internet forums in English and in German. Those languages, again, for historic reasons. We have about 1,500 registered users, patients. We have about 600 uh, people accessing our forums every day. So we estimate that we're reaching about 50 to 100,000 uh, patients per year. Uh, that's an estimate, maybe less or more. <coughs> Nobody really knows, we really don't count them. And we also are representing uh, Dupitran patients in organizations like uh, IIPO, which is the International Association of Patients <coughs> Organizations, or in dealing with specific local uh, organizations like NICE or NHS or something like that. Okay, now uh, one of our key goals is informing about uh, theories, uh, therapies, informing about therapies of uh, trends and in, in that we have a specific goal. Uh, and to explain that, I go back to a publication which is 50 years old about. And that's, uh, and luck at that time already wrote, the past little attempt has been made to classify the stage of the disease and then employ therapeutic methods based upon the stage of the process. Now, that's still true today, I told you that. But what we are driving at, or what, what we think would make sense, is something like that. We have stage and related uh, therapies. Now, you, you could certainly discuss whether this should be a full point or, or 
could have another one here, or, or whether polygonals also could extend in those regions. That's something to be discussed, but basically that's, that's what you should have in mind, a staged treatment and trying to keep the disease, sorry, trying to keep the disease at bay to the worst extent. And uh, we're also supporting research. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> we do not have that much money, but we, we try to do our best. So we have some small initiatives where we uh, collect data ourselves because we have access to uh, many patients via the forum, via email, so we have uh, email addresses of 1,500 patients. So uh, we, in, in this case, for example, we ask patients who are taking NIC whether they see any effect on, on their dipotrans and, and found that if you take it long enough, it, it does have some effect, but it's not really unfortunately. We are supporting research projects also by motivating patients <coughs> and clinics, because we also have contact to a lot of clinics, uh, to participate in those projects. So we, we can help a little bit of that. And, and, and we have been doing this in the past. And for the future, we plan to uh, provide grants for specific projects. That's something which probably will come next year or the year after. And uh, we are uh, working on something which we call iBook, which is an international literature database. And we, we hope to get some more uh, or good contacts here also on this conference. The idea is that we can merge data from various clinics from various countries into one big database so that we can statistically improve uh, our uh, research and get better um, statistical numbers and everyone has access to it. So for the concept is that clinics load their data into the data, uh, common database and for research purpose they can also tap it and can tap the whole pool of it. And finally, of course, we are trying, we see much, a lot of value, but Charlie uh, explained it much better, in bringing people together, not going on their own specific conference, hand surgeons on the hand surgery conference, and radio therapists on the radio therapy conference, and so forth. No, let, let's work together, let's learn from each other, other, let's create synergy and be better afterwards. So, this conference is, uh, we consider an important step, although I have to say, the praise goes to Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> because he really did by far the best work. Now, uh, finally, <laughs> the Dupitran Award. Very important. The Dupitran Award, we introduced the Dupitran Award. It recognizes exceptional scientific publications on research and clinical management uh, of uh, Dupitran and Lederhose. Oh, no, this guy still authorizes it. Sometimes so I, I'm not sure whether you can provide a trophy like that. But <laughs> it, it <seems> the, <laughs> the award carries, right now, being a poor organization, the monetary price of 1,000 euros and is awarded annually. Uh, the publishing language ought to be English or German. The application, applicants uh, can be physicians or scientists and should not be older than 45 years. But we, we, we try to, to help the young ones. But uh, anyway, usually there's a team of people working on it, so if the lead one is younger than 45 years, that's fine. The winner will be selected jointly by our advisory board and the management board of the Digital Society. Now, uh, there's more information on it on the uh, internet about that, and note the last thing, apply before the euro loses its value. Okay, that's it. Thank you. We keep the time uh, for questions afterwards and the little time which is left, maybe somebody else. Yeah.